Welcome to Mortification of Spin, a casual conversation about things that count with Carl Truman and Todd Pruitt, a podcast of the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals. Let's join this week's conversation. Welcome to Mortification of Spin. My name's Carl Truman, Professor of Biblical and Religious Studies at the beautiful Grove City College in Western Pennsylvania. Here, as always, with my long-standing friend, uh, Reverend Todd Pruitt, pastor of Covenant Presbyterian Church, a congregation of the Presbyterian Church in America, in Harrisonburg, Virginia. <laughs> you know, Good Carl, to be with you, Todd. Th- this is kind of a running joke with us, but... Um, it, you labor so much just to remember each of those details. And, and, and I do notice that every once in a while your throat catches right before you say reverend, yeah. uh, Todd Pruitt. I, I can tell that that's Still particularly... Still can't quite believe it. That's a challenge uh, for you. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I get it. I, I, I understand. Um, it's just because you've never seen me at my most sanctified. Yeah, yeah. And so that's what it is, probably. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I hope so, because if what I have seen you at your most sanctified, that is not a great judgment on your overall sanctification. This is this is true. This is true. You know, you and I were talking earlier. Um, we're on this little uh, text loop. Uh, you and I, um, Kevin DeYoung, and our friend Matt Yusey in Florida, and um, every once in a while, Matt Yusey and I will 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 text each other individually, um, uh, be, because because it'll be something. Um, not not dirty, but but a little irreverent. And we're and and Kevin is such a tender-hearted, nice guy. We it, further along in his sanctification than us. Then we think we better not text this uh, to Kevin. We'll so leave him out. Now, why now did we, you leave me? Out? Well, that that's a good question. I, I think I think because we're, we're we're concerned. We 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 want you to continue to mature uh, for Katrina's sake, if nothing else. Um, and so if, if, if we were to, to tweet you a joke or something like that or text you a joke, um, you might repeat it in, 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 a, you know, in mixed company. In an inappropriate, in an inappropriate yes, time. Yes. And, uh, we, I, I, think it, I think it comes down to judgment. We just don't trust your judgment. Um, <laughs> Kevin, we, 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 we want to honor um, his, uh, his overall um, uh, decency and sweetness. Yeah. With you, we're just concerned about Are your you judgment. Are you sure it's not just you're sharing the latest headlines from Alec Jones in Infowars? <laughs> well, uh, you know, if you want to stay on top, of the truth. Um, uh, of course, you know, we go to our friend Alex Jones. Yeah. Um, so. Well, and talking of inappropriate behavior online, <laughs> that brings us to the topic we want to talk about today, and that is appropriate Christian behavior in an election year. Now, appropriate Christian behavior, of course, is, a, is an important topic any year, any day of any year. But it does seem that uh, two things are in play at the moment that, that I fear could seriously undermine a lot of Christian testimony. One of them is very divisive election year, Mm -hmm. where everybody has strong opinions on everything, combined with social media. Mm -hmm. Social media really becomes a thing around about 2015. Mm -hmm. This is the third big presidential election we've had, where a lot of it is being played out on social media. And that raises peculiar temptations for, for the Christians. So we want to talk today about... Uh, how can Christians have strong opinions on things that it's important to have strong opinions about mm-hmm. uh, and express those opinions, though, in a way that does not undermine their broader Christian witness and does not, more importantly, perhaps, uh, bring shame to the name of Christ? Mm-hmm. Uh, Todd, thoughts mm-hmm. on that? Well, it's a huge issue pastorally. I, mean, I, I don't know a pastor out there who's not having to deal with this. And, and, and really, you know, the, the, since the 2016 election, um, wh- whether you are pro-Trump, anti-Trump, or I'll hold my nose and vote for Trump, you know, wherever you are on the continuum, there, you have to admit that that 2016 was a particularly um, virulent time um, in in terms of our 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 public discussion on politics and related issues. It was interesting. I was I was watching. Um, the most well, well, the, the the debate so far, the one debate there's been between our two present candidates 
for the office of presidency, uh, the current president, Joe Biden, and now his uh, Republican opponent, Donald Trump. And um, I was watching it with my my youngest son, who's in his early 20s. And there were times where we just burst out laughing because of the childishness Mm -hmm. of the whole display. It was crass. It was rude. I mean, what the... This debate went down in history for, for, among other reasons, that the statement, I never had sex with a porn star, was actually used in a presidential debate. I don't say that to be funny. I say that to grieve over that because I'm sitting there with my my son who's in his early 20s, and, and I, I'm explaining to him that there was a time uh, in the not-too-distant past where, where those things just weren't brought up. Well, with Jimmy Carter in 1976 gives what was really a fairly bland interview to Playboy magazine without getting the approval of his minders. And it it nearly capsizes his presidential campaign. nearly sunk it. That is less than 50 years ago. Right. I remember watching... I was raised in a very kind of politically conscious household, very conservative. I know that you do surprise me, Tom. I'm I'm shocked. Yeah, exactly. And I remember watching. As if I've never known. (laughs) I remember watching the Reagan Mondale debates for the 1984 uh, presidential race. It was uh, Reagan running for re election. And whatever you thought about the race at that time, what you saw were two grown up men having a grown up discussion respectfully of one another. And I can't imagine that happening anymore yeah. now. And I, I, I point that out there because it's just a, a microcosm of what we see among the electorate, mm. among how we're speaking to each other, among, among how Christians are debating these issues. It's become so personal. Now, here's my question. Do you think some of that has to do with, cer- certainly uh, social media has poisoned it because we become very, very brave on social media. Um, but do you think also, you know, when... I I hearken back to the Mondale-Reagan debates, not for the 1984 election. You know, they were talking about things like tax policies. I mean, those were the big issues. Tax policies, Social Security policy, um, uh, Cold War policies, which at that time between Reagan and Mondale weren't weren't especially divergent. They had some differences, but but they weren't radically different. Um, Now, the issues that our candidates are debating are about whether or not we should uh, surgically mutilate children. And so, in some sense, the increased heat of the discussion is, is understandable because for the first time, our politicians are meddling in ideas that they would have never approached 10, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. Yeah, I think there's a there's a fundamental war against nature going on, which is interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we were talking earlier on uh, about you know, when when I was growing up in the 70s and 80s, the big debates in British politics were rates of income tax and you know the economy. Mm-hmm. To what extent should the economy be mixed, i.e., state state controlled or directed, and, and to what extent should it be privately owned uh, and a free market. Uh, Whereas now the issues are profoundly anthropological. Mm-hmm. I, I would set those against the background, I think, of you know, what I've talked about in, in my work as expressive individualism. You know, what is expressive individualism? It's that which really makes my feelings and my inner life and my happiness the supreme good over mm-hmm. all other things. And that tilts us towards a selfishness. And I would also say it tilts us towards an infantilism as well. Because society itself becomes corrupting. That which used to be seen as helping us become adults Mm -hmm. becomes that which actually corrupts us. So I think there's a broader social dynamic at play in an expressive individualist world that tilts us towards infantilism. Mm -hmm. So politicians behaving like infants looks authentic to us. Right. You know, think of, the, uh, right. of, think of the crudity of language. I think when I was growing up, had a British politician ever dropped the F word yeah. in a public statement, it would have ended their careers. Mm-hmm. Uh, that sort of crudity would simply not have been tolerable. Why? Because we lived in a world where self-control and reserve were considered to be virtues. Mm-hmm. And the mature person was the self-controlled person. 
Now we live in an expressive individualist world where if somebody isn't dropping the Mm F-bomb, we think they're hiding something. They sound phony because everybody knows people use worse language in private than they do in public. What are they hiding from us? So I think there's a strong infantilist tilt in modern culture. Look how real I am. Yeah, Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, you know, to me, it's embarrassing when I see uh, grown men like uh, Donald Trump or... Joseph Biden, uh, using profanities. Right. It's a kind of, do you, do you not have rich enough vocabularies to express yourself <laughs> right. uh, without resorting to those things? Are you not adults? Well, mm-hmm. th- that's not the point. Yeah. The point is they're trying to present themselves as genuine, mm-hmm. authentic, swaggering individuals to their right. public. I'm of a generation that regards that as rather pitiful, it mm-hmm. has to be said. But unfortunately, it seems to strike a real chord. And it plays over into that question of, of how... Christians should behave mm-hmm. in this because, you know, there's a monkey see, monkey do dimension to this. Yeah. Uh, our leaders tend to be reflections of us and our leaders tend to set the tone for us mm-hmm. as well. And so what we've seen is that the infantilism of our political class is reflected in the infantilism of many in the population in general. Yeah. One of the challenges um, that I try to issue to our congregation on a fairly regular basis, particularly in um, in election seasons, is and I, and I never do any political speeches from the pulpit. We, we'll never have a politician. I never get into policies or anything like that. Um, but when it comes time to vote, I encourage them to exercise their their uh, their prerogatives if if their conscience will allow them to vote for someone and I always point that out you may be in a position there may be a year where your conscience just won't allow you to vote for any of the above that's a perfectly uh, uh, um, uh, good option for some Christians in certain election years but but if your conscience allows you um, be be as engaged and involved as you're able to but but do so as a Christian um, demonstrating the Christian virtues that we're that we're given, we're, we're not going to to quote win the culture um, by aping the culture. If you know, seek influence, push back against the darkness, um, but do so uniquely as Christian. And one of the things that's been bothering me a lot, um, just in my own circles of of you know broadly uh, Presbyterian conservative circles is the rise of this kind of new brand of Christian nationalism. And we've talked about it a lot. Um, it's being hotly debated. Uh, your denomination and my denomination, the OPC and the PCA, um, are having to deal with it because pastors and other leaders in our denominations are are embracing, I, I'm calling it neo-Christian nationalism versus just the old-fashioned idea that it's good for Christians to be involved and to... What we might to, call Christian patriotism. Exactly, perhaps. exactly. Yeah. Push back against the darkness, be, in, be as involved as your government allows you to be involved, um, labor for the good of your neighbor and for the, for the honor of the Lord. But this neo-Christian nationalism, which, which um, seeks to have the, the state do the, the church's job or the churches do the state's job, and it comes with a very angry veneer to it. And this gets to kind of what, what we're talking about here. Uh, when I look at these, these men who are advancing this kind of neo-Christian nationalism, I see very angry people who vent their anger quite liberally on others. And what they'll do is they'll appeal to an instance of a prophet mocking the prophets of Baal, mm. for instance, and then making that a normative approach to Christian dialogue, or they'll take Jesus turning over the tables and they'll make that a normative kind of posture towards any disagreement or conflict. And really what they're doing is they're using the Bible to cover their anger. These are angry people. Yeah. And yet when you read, for example, the letter of Peter, we are, Peter's clearly making normative statements there. About exactly. How to now, when we say normative, that does not mean that there aren't dramatic exceptions. Sure. But the normative statements are very much in the line of you know, the sort of, you know, uh, a soft word turns away anger. Right. Behave with integrity and honor when you're dealing with mm-hmm. those who, who seek to persecute mm-hmm. you, yeah. Yeah, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, when you suffer, don't act as though something unusual yeah. were happening yeah. to you. I mean, it's interesting that the, the example of, you know, well, what would you do? When I, when I made a case recently for 
uh, for, for Peter's arguments about how to mm. deal with, with a hostile uh, world, a lot of the response will, you know, well, what if the Gestapo are knocking <laughs> on your door demanding to know if you've got Jews in your right. basement? Wouldn't you lie? Well, of course, the answer there is, yes, I would lie. Mm-hmm. We live in a fallen world, and sometimes you're placed in situations where whatever you do involves a sin. Right. Uh, Helmut Thielicke, the great uh, Lutheran theologian, is very good on this point. Mm. We live in a fallen world, and therefore we will often find ourselves in moral situations where, for want of a better term, it's the lesser of two right. evils that one's faced with. The irony is, of course, that uh, you know, the Gestapo knocking on your door and demanding to know if you've got Jews in your basement, that's not quite the equivalent of <laughs> saying something unpleasant about the president on Twitter. Right. You know, right. There's a big difference here mm-hmm. between, mm-hmm. yep, yeah, there are lives immediately on the line. Right. And I just don't like this politician because he's pushing a policy mm-hmm. that I happen to disapprove of, even if it's a very wicked policy. Right. Or uh, bring it even closer. Um, uh, hiding a Jew from a murderous Nazi is not the same thing as going online and accusing a fellow Presbyterian who doesn't buy your vision of Christian nationalism of, and using crass language of accusing him of being a homosexual. Yeah. Like, like that, those yeah. aren't equivalents. Yes. That, yeah. that, that, that's, that's not Elisha at that moment or Elijah. Uh, that, that's not Elijah pro, uh, mocking the prophets of Baal. No, no. And, and I think that's important to remember that, you know, we live in difficult times and there are mm-hmm. some big challenges, but we can't always default to the exceptions mm-hmm. just because we don't like what is going on. Yeah. Peter was ministering under Nero. Exactly. These are pretty extreme circumstances. And I was very struck recently reading a section from Bonhoeffer's letters and papers from prison. And of course, Bonhoeffer often gets cited as, as you know, somebody who engaged in rebellion. But there, mm-hmm. there are a couple of things to know about Bonhoeffer. One of them is how difficult it was for him to get there. Mm, you know, he, right. he didn't immediately jump into rebellion. Mm-hmm. It took him a long time to get there. And secondly, when he's, he's reflecting on this in prison, one of the questions he asks himself is, has the way we've behaved, my, my friends behaved, that we thought was right and appropriate and proper, but has it really disqualified us from leading a post-Hitler Germany. Mm -hmm. In other words, have we ourselves dirted our hands to the extent that we've done things? You're a bit like David, for example, in the Old Testament. He does the Lord's will, but then when he comes to build the temple, the Lord says, no, it's not for you to build my temple. You're you're a man of blood. Mm -hmm. It's You desire a good thing, but you're a man of blood. You're not qualified to build my temple in the way that your son will be. And I think as Christians, we we need to always think about are we dehumanizing ourselves in the way that we oppose those whose policies are often dehumanizing? Mm-hmm. You know, if somebody's pushing the trans issue, to me, that's a dehumanizing policy. They have right. to be opposed. But do we run a risk of dehumanizing ourselves mm-hmm. in the way that we treat our opponents? Are we crossing a line? I, I had an experience a few years ago at Grove, of course. A lot of our kids want to go into politics. Mm-hmm. Our politics department is one of our real strong suits on, on campus. And I had a young, uh, one, of my, uh, one of my students uh, spent the summer working as an intern staffer for, I think it was a, one of the governor's campaigns, probably the Pennsylvania governor's campaign, one of the candidates for that. And at the end of the summer, he came to me and he said, I'm, I'm just not going to go into politics, he said. It is so dirty, yeah. I fear for my own soul. Right. Now, that's not a justification of saying Christians should not be involved in politics. But it is to say I that, it, that young man was asking the right question. Absolutely. You know, what does it profit a man if he gains the world mm-hmm. and loses his soul? Yeah. That's something that I don't hear. I don't see a lot of reflection on that yeah. in the loud-mouthed Christian nationalist circles that have been Correct. emerging. Yeah. Yeah, what does it profit a man if he gains the world and loses his own mm-hmm. soul? Not my words, by the way. Exactly. Those are spoken by one much greater Absolutely. than me. Yeah, my, my wife and I were having a conversation just the other evening about this issue of if you're a Christian, how, how do you go into politics at this point? Do you have any hope of winning elected office if you behave like a Christian ought to behave, mm. if you draw lines where a Christian must draw lines. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you've, you've mentioned Peter. I, I would just remind our, our listeners 
again, Peter ministering under Nero, (laughs) ministering to a persecuted church as a persecuted man, wrote things like, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Again, he's writing this to people who are being persecuted, yeah. not the persecutors. By Nero, by the right, way. Yeah. Right, right. With your... no chance of getting rid of him in an election. Exactly. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you, not if, but when, when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of his visitation. He goes on and he says... Um, <clears throat> Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called that you, that you may obtain a yeah, blessing. Yeah. Carl, that, that couldn't stand in more radical contrast to what we are seeing among some of those who are pushing this new neo sort of Christian nationalism, which, which revels in reviling, yeah. which even then uses the scripture as a justification for it. You know, I know yeah. a, a part of the pushback against your really excellent article that you wrote a month ago or so, part of the pushback against you on that, unfortunately, was that, Again, you know, well, what Peter writes there is not normative for the Christian life when it when it, it most obviously is compared what, to Rahab. Compared, I think to, it's Rahab. Much, compared to the unjust steward, it's, yeah, it's, it's a much easier passage to exegete. That's, that's right. Any two-year-old yeah. can exegete that passage. exactly. But the the point is that is that Elijah mocking the the prophets of Baal is easier for me to do yeah. than not reviling when I'm reviled. Yeah, and if you're listening out there, I've got some bad news for you. You are not Elijah. <laughs> you are not Elijah. You are a sojourner and an exile. That's right. That's right. And, and that's an interesting point because, one, I, I, again, I frequently on the Lord's Day, in various ways, either in the sermon or in the pastoral prayer, I'm reminding this congregation of men and women who I really care a lot about that that's who they are yeah. in this world. Um, I, I cannot find a, 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 a proper exegesis of a biblical passage that would lead them to believe that they're on the verge of taking everything over. I, I, I'm sorry to my post-millennial friends. I can't find that in Scripture. And that, again, that does not mean that they sit back passively. We push back because we love the Lord and we love our neighbor. That's why we push back against these violations of nature. Yep. I mean, Carl, you uphold the spirituality of the church, but you spend a great deal of your time doing just that, engaged in the public sphere, pushing back against wickedness. Yeah, admittedly, I haven't courageously tweeted from my mother's basement for <laughs> the last few years on all of these issues. I've merely crisscrossed the country speaking sometimes in fairly hostile environments on them. But other than that, I'm a kind of passive Anabaptist, I guess. <laughs> but, you know, it is, it is a good example of those who would, who would uh, throw out that false accusation that what you and I are saying is, don't be engaged, wrong. Um, we just recorded an episode with with Miles Davis from Hillsdale College. Not Miles Davis. He's Miles great, Davis. He's been dead a while, but you know we we, we don't endear go to Miles Smith. <laughs> Miles, My, boy, Miles Smith, the legendary the, jazz trumpeter and professor at that's Hillsdale the, College. That's the the uh, what is it the, the 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 birth of the cool or what was his? Uh, I've got the album actually, the Miles Davis album with that uh, religion and republic. I think anyway, but anyway, Miles Smith. Yeah, Miles Smith. Thanks for coming on here. And if you Miles Smith, if you have not listened to Miles Davis, I would encourage you to listen to his early work. His later work in the 80s, I'm not a fan of, uh, but if you go, anyway. Birth of the Cool is Birth a of the album. Cool is a, a great, very good album. great album. Now, yeah. um, Kind of Blue as well. Exactly. Kind of Blue is a good one. It's, it's very, very good. But one of the things, again, that I, that I try to ex- explain to our congregation is when, because sometimes I'm prevailed upon as a pastor to, to start addressing more, more political issues from the pulpit. Yeah. And you just tell people to read your Twitter account. Okay? Uh, yeah, so just read that, just read that. <laughs> but I, 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 and, and some folks are dismayed when I, when I resist that. And one of the things I explain is that, look, mission of the church is narrow. Mission of the church is very, is very specific um, to advance the gospel, to make disciples. Mm. But the mission of Christians is quite broad. We, we go out as disciples and function in the, in the vocation that the Lord has given us as Christian people. And I hope that, that our churches are doing a good job to 
equip our folks to do that. But insofar as you're able to push back against things that harm your neighbor, well, of course we do that. If that makes me a Christian nationalist, okay. But um, uh, I, th- I think that just makes me an old-fashioned, as, as you've said, uh, Christian patriot. I, I, I want to love my neighbor well. Yeah. And so... Yeah, I think we need to... And, and Miles, I think, did, did this very well when he not was... Not Miles Davis, but Miles Smith. Not Miles Davis, Miles Smith. Uh, distinguished between you know, the kinds of Christian nationalism. Right. It's Christian nationalism as defined by the New York Times, mm-hmm. which is anybody who seems to be slightly to the right of the New York Times. Right. And there's Christian nationalism as defined by real you know, emphasis on the nationalist rather than mm-hmm. the Christian. So I think we need to distinguish yep. those two things. And one thing you and I have talked about, Carl, is that in Carl from, from the OPC and me from the PCA is um, I I think when we examine men for ordination, um, you know, we need to ask them, you know, one of the things I want to do is I want to ferret out progressivism, but now with the rise of some of this stuff we're seeing that goes under the moniker of of Christian nationalism, um, those from the extreme end of my own camp, I I want to be able to say, um, no, we don't want that in our presbytery. Um, And so we, we need to ask them, real specific questions about some of these things. And I think as well, uh, look at social media accounts. Yes. Um, I know that there's at least one Lutheran seminary now in the United States that requires all of its students to uh, be utterly transparent about social media mm-hmm. activity. And I believe that if you, if you hide a social media account and you're discovered to have, have that account, mm-hmm. that's an immediate dismissal from the seminary. And this right. is a way, it's been a way, I think, in, in Lutheran circles of keeping, you know, again, it's a, Nazi is an overused word, mm-hmm. but there are some genuine neo-Nazis yes. out there who've may been trying to really press in, particularly to the Lutheran world. Right. And this has been, you know, this policy has been developed as a way of trying to at least set up some guardrails mm-hmm. to keep out the wrong people from ministry. I mean, we talked before, I, I think Christian nationalism, these people are not going to take over America for no. Jesus anytime no, soon. No, they're not. But they are going to wreak havoc in congregations and yes. denominations, and that's where we need... You know, I don't take them seriously nationally. They're not mm-hmm. an existential threat to anything whatsoever at right. a national level. But they are an existential threat to congregations and denominations, and that's why we need to be very aware of what's going on online relative to, to individuals coming forward for ministry now. Correct, yeah. Well, I'll just say a final word of, of encouragement um, to hopefully all of us, which is to take to heart the words of the Apostle Peter that were read, as well as the words of our Lord and elsewhere uh, of of virtues that that the Apostle Paul holds up over and over and over again. We are pressed into this responsibility to speak to each other um, with love, with understanding, with patience, with kindness, um, to respond to curses with blessing, to respond to hatred with prayer. This is the normative way that Christians are to behave even during an election year. And as I think about the congregation I get to serve as a pastor and the faithful labors of the men and women I pastor to be a a light in our community, I'm encouraged by that. And I would just say to my fellow pastors, hold up that high um, standard that Jesus and the apostles held up for us um, in these days and be a model for it. Well, if you'll go to our, our website, mortificationofspin.org, um, we just like to give away books. And um, we are right now offering, um, for a few lucky listeners, um, a copy of uh, this guy, Carl Truman, who's sitting next to me. He, he writes books periodically. Um, his latest is called Crisis of Confidence, which I would encourage you to get. It has to do with um, the, 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 the goodness, and I would even say, you know, the, the necessity of good, sound confessions of faith. And, and it, it also has a chapter dealing with the, uh, the current challenges we're seeing in our culture and the, the war, what I would call the war against nature as God has established it. And he has a chapter um, dealing with that as well and how the confessions help us in that regard. While you're there, if you'd like to make a contribution to um, uh, the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals, we would encourage you to do that so that they can continue to provide uh, good content. Until then, thanks so much for joining us, and we'll be with you next time.
Thanks for listening to Mortification of Spin, a podcast of the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals. For more on topics like this, visit mortificationofspin.org, where you can find other articles by Carl and Todd, browse the archive of past episodes, and make a donation. We'll talk to you next time on Mortification of Spin. Thank you.